Let's take our Bibles. We'll be coming to the Lord's table uh, before we're done this morning. If you didn't receive the emblems on the way out, later on our ushers will make them available to you. But we started a series a couple of weeks ago on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher that ever lived. And um, we're going to work our way through this for weeks and months. We've started to look at it. And uh, we're, we're, we're going to go slow here for several weeks as we uh, unpack the Beatitudes, these statements of blessing from the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we looked at uh, the sermon as a whole uh, a week or two ago. Last week, we looked at uh, the, the, the theme of happiness, which is uh, what Jesus is promising here. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger. Uh, Jesus wants you to enjoy true happiness and wants you to understand the path to it. And now we're beginning to look at each of the Beatitudes, a message I've called the few and the humble. The Marines talk about the few and the proud, but Jesus talks about the few and the humble. Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Lewis Evans was the pastor at First Presbyterian Church here in Hollywood, and uh, he was a good and godly man uh, who pastored that church many years and many years ago. The story is told that he went on a world tour, and he visited several mission fields where some of his congregation were ministering. And as part of his tour, he ended up in Korea where he connected with a former member of his church who had opened up a medical mission. This man was a very renowned and very uh, good uh, surgeon while he was here in Los Angeles, but the Lord got a hold of him and he dedicated his gift and his life to missions. And so when uh, Lewis Evans gets to that mission field in Korea, he arrives as the man is in the middle of a surgery. It takes several hours before we'll actually see him. The man emerges exhausted after an exacting and precise surgery on a little girl. And as they started to talk, the pastor said to his former congregant, he said, you know what, I'm just interested. What, what, what would you have charged for that surgery back in Los Angeles, he said, oh, he said, I could have charged several thousand dollars. He says, how much did you charge this little girl and her family? To which that man, that good and godly man replied, oh, a few cents, a few cents and the smile of God. And then he went on to tell his pastor, I've never been happier. I've always enjoyed that story. And I've always been intrigued and inspired by that statement, a few cents and the smile of God. Because that's priceless, the smile of God, the benediction of God. Don't we all want to live beneath the smile of God? Don't we all want to enjoy the benediction pronounced in Numbers 6, 24 to 26? The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you and the Lord make his face to shine upon you. It's a precious and priceless thing to have the smile of God over you and to live under the roof of his benediction and to know and enjoy his favor. In fact, if you go to Psalm 4, verse 6, that Bible verse talks about the desire for God to lift up the light of his countenance upon the psalmist. That's repeated in Psalm 80 verse 3 and Psalm 89 verse 15. Life comes from God and therefore life is found in God and therefore only the smile of God can produce true happiness. The smile of God ought to be the goal of our life. For just as the light of the sun brings life, so the light of God's countenance is the source of true life. So with that in mind, let's rush back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And as we saw last week, Jesus begins his sermon with a study on true happiness, life at its best, living under the smile of God. 
That's what we have here in these Beatitudes. And we're going to look at the first one, this first grace, poverty of spirit, which, by the way, is the grace that allows us to enjoy the other graces. Because we saw last week there's a progression, isn't there, to the Beatitudes? There's the root, the shoot, the fruit. Remember we talked about that last week? If you think about it, this is where blessing begins. This is where you get to enjoy the favor and enrichment of God at, at the place of poverty of spirit. Life in the kingdom begins here as you and I understand our desperate need of God and our poverty of spirit and our sinfulness which produces a mourning before God, a repentance, a crying out to God which produces a meekness and a humility before God which leaves us hungering for Him and his righteousness. And as you and I come to know God and pursue God and are hungry for him, God brings mercy and and peace and, and purity to our lives. And if we live that kind of life, as John MacArthur says, we'll become an irritant to the world and they'll begin to persecute us because our light will expose their darkness and our joy will expose their unhappiness. So this is the the grace that invites all the other graces. Now, we're going to look at this first one uh, under three headings, the meaning, the means, the mercy. In fact, I'm going to take this outline and put it on top of every beatitude because we want to learn what is meant by poverty of spirit and by mourning and by meekness. And then we want to learn how that comes about in our life, or what does that look like in our life as God produces it? And then we're going to see that, that that's followed by mercy, by, by a certain outcome. We, we, those who are poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom. Those who are mourned shall be comforted. Those who are meek shall inherit the earth. Meaning, or me, meaning means mercy. Let's begin. The meaning. What does Jesus mean when he talks about the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now let me begin by what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean material poverty. The kingdom of God does not particularly belong to those who are economically disadvantaged. There's nothing in Scripture that would support that. In fact, many rich people belong in God's kingdom. In fact, Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians in 1 Timothy 6, addresses those who are rich, that they would be rich in good works and help those who are in need. And so we're not talking about material poverty, although the reason that people believe it could be that is because over in Luke 6, verse 20, in the corresponding synoptic gospel of Luke, in that version of the Beatitudes, it simply reads, blessed are the poor which could leave you thinking that it's the economically disadvantaged that inherit the kingdom. And this has led to a false theology called liberation theology, where there is a God's bias towards the poor. And salvation comes to those who are in need materially and physically and who live a disadvantaged life. Certainly God's heart is towards the poor. And we might make an argument that, if, that, 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 that in poverty there's a certain disposition to needing God and trusting Him. But that's not what it means. Matthew speaks of the poor in spirit. That's who we're talking about. This isn't a material issue. This is a spiritual issue. The phrase in spirit qualifies the kind of poverty we're dealing with. It's poverty of spirit. It's a recognition of one's impoverishment before God. Now, certainly, Christianity was found, found a greater reception among the poorer classes. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 27. In fact, the early critics of Christianity attacked it because of its seeming weakness. It was made up of old people and women and children. And therefore, it was seen as weak. The, the early church was seen not as a basket of 
deplorables, but a basket of ignorables. And while that's true, it would be a mistake to think that Jesus is arguing for or, or the church celebrated material poverty. To take Jesus that way would lead to the ridiculous idea that you don't help the poor because the poor are a good place to be blessed by God. No, it's not material poverty. Secondly, it's not poor personality or false humility. This is not a call to an impoverished view of self. This is not a promotion of shyness and sheepishness. This is not a call to downplay your gifts or discount your abilities. This isn't a call to be embarrassed if God has blessed you materially. To be poor in spirit does not mean to see yourself as having no value or no worth. Because each of us are created by God. And we're created for His glory, by His purpose, for His pleasure. And when you and I discover our purpose, we will discover His pleasure. It's a false humility that doesn't allow you to declare that God has made you for certain things. And that by His grace and gifting, you're able to do those things well. We don't need to be a kind of spiritual Uriah heap in Charles Dickens, David Copperfield, who kept going around talking about how humble he was. No, I love that statement by Eric Little in the movie Chariots of Fire. Remember when he was talking to his sister, he says what? God has made me fast. I'm good at running. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. It would be a false humility for Eric Little to deny his giftedness and the pleasure he finds in being productive in the means by which God has blessed him. So it's not material poverty. It's not a poor personality or false humility. So if it's not that, what is it? Well, let's begin with the word poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is a word certainly tied to material disadvantage. It it speaks of those who are without worldly goods. In fact, it's used, interestingly, in Luke 16, 20, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus of the beggar, Lazarus. That's our word. It, It speaks of begging, which gives us a real clue as to what poverty of spirit means. You see, there was another Greek word for poverty or for general lack of material well-being. In fact, the world in which Jesus lived, the majority of people were poor. In the Western world, the poor are a subset, or generally, we're not poor. But in Jesus' world, it was flipped. The majority of people were poor. And there was a word for that, but that's not the word that Jesus uses. He uses a word that means begging poor. See, in Jesus' world, most people lived hand to mouth day to day. That's why he teaches us to pray for our, he teaches, taught them to pray for their daily bread. But this word is not that. This is a word perhaps for the cripple, the, the lame, those who are incapable of working, who are by the side of the road begging Who's, they pull their clothes over their head. They don't look up as they stretch out their hand and beg. They're in a state of destitution and, and shame. That's our word. And now you take that word and you attach it to the element of life in which it must be manifest, the spirit, the inner man, the, the heart. So so poverty of spirit then is an inner attitude that recognizes one's spiritual destitution and bankruptcy before God. In, In fact, if you go back to the Psalms, more often than not, the term poor has a religious and spiritual twist to it. It it speaks not of the material poor, it it speaks of the the spiritual poor. Uh, Think about the, the famous verse in, in uh, Psalm 34 and, and verse 6, this 
poor man cried to the Lord, and the Lord saved him out of all his troubles. When you go down to verse 18, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves those who have a contrite spirit. You get a, a similar thought over in uh, Psalm 40 and verse 17, but I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks in me. You are my help and my deliverer. In fact, the, the background to this idea may be Psalm 86, verses 1 to 5. Bow down your ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life. Be merciful to me. Rejoice the soul of your servant, for to you, Lord, I lift my soul. So the poor man in the Psalms was a man who needed to be delivered from his sin, from himself, from evil, and from dire circumstances. So blessed are the poor in spirit, those who know their need. You could translate it fortunate are those who know their need of God's enriching grace. Poverty of spirit is It's to recognize that you have nothing with with which to commend yourself to God. It's to feel your sin and your lecherous heart. It's to know that nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. It's to know that the only thing you contribute to your own salvation is the sin that made the death of Christ necessary. It's to know that you're totally at God's mercy. It's to tremble before his holiness. It's to be stripped of any confidence in yourself. It's to feel undone. It's to feel spiritually naked. It's to say to the Lord like Peter, depart from me for I am a sinful man. It's not to be wise in your own eyes. It's to fear pride and self-righteousness and self-exaltation. John Calvin's good here. He only who is reduced to nothing in himself and relies on the mercy of God is poor in spirit. John Piper is good here. What then is poverty of spirit? It is a sense of moral uncleanness before God. It is a sense of personal unworthiness before God. It is a sense that there, if there is to be any life or joy or usefulness, it will have to be all of God and all of grace. Charles Spurgeon is good here, as always. The way to rise in the kingdom is to sink in yourself. Don't you see this trait in the saints of God? Isn't this where kingdom life begins? Isaiah, before the blazing holiness of God, is smashed to a thousand peoples. He disintegrates and falls before God, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Isaiah 6, 5. Isn't this true of David? Who in hearing of the favor and blessing of God, in 2 Samuel 7, verse 18, about God's going to establish his throne and bless his descendants, what does David say? Who am I? And what is my house? that you brought me so far. I don't deserve this. You, you, you've taken me, he'll say this in the Psalms, from the sheepfold of my father, and you've made me a shepherd over Israel? Who am I? I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. But if I become anything, it's you. It's grace. What about Peter in the boat, Lord? Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. I I, I don't deserve your company. I don't belong here where you belong. That's poverty of spirit, isn't it? Isn't poverty of spirit the publican in the story that Jesus told that we covered, guys, remember? In Luke 18, 13 to 14, Jesus talks about justification, how a man is made right before God, how a man knows that he's in a right relationship with God. And he talks about two people. He talks about a Pharisee, a clergyman, and a publican, a sinner, a 
uh, you know, a, a, a guy that has lived a profligate life and they're in the temple. And, and you know what's interesting? The Pharisee, he prays, but he never asks for anything. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't ask for a thing. Why? Because he didn't have poverty of spirit. He didn't think he needed anything. The, he, he believed the Lord needed to know how good he was. I'm better than this, than most people. I, you know, I do, I, I do this and I, I don't do this. I'm, I'm not an extortioner. I'm not an adulterer. And he sings his own praises in the presence of the one who should be praised. But the back row with his head bowed is a man who can't even look up to heaven. That's beggarly, isn't it? It's not what beggars do. They can hardly look up. They're so ashamed and destitute. That's Jesus' word. And that's what the publican is. He can't even look up to God and just cries, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And what does Jesus say? Which one of these men went home justified? Now, the average guy on the street would say, well, I, would, I guess the good guy, the religious man, who's balancing the scales before God. No, it's the man who recognizes he has nothing Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. The path to happiness and the road to recovery begins by acknowledging our rancid wretchedness and the need for God's grace. Didn't John Newton, the old slave trader, come to recognize that? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Listen, that saved a decent guy like me. It just made the difference, topped it up. No. See if the rats like me. I once was lost, but now I'm fine. Was blind, but now I see. See what? See the glory of Christ. See the ugliness of my sin and the poverty that I'm in spiritually. We can never know the riches of grace until we understand the debt of our sin and our unworthiness. We can never rise to new heights of meaning and fulfillment until we buy in humility before God in utter desperation. We can never receive the gift of eternal life through Christ until our hands are empty of self-righteousness and self-reliance. You know, I, when I was preparing this week, I read a, an article by John Piper on poverty of spirit. And, and in the article, it tells about being in uh, Aspen, Colorado, around about 1978. He's speaking on the campus of a university, speaking to some intervarsity students, some who are students uh, there uh, in, the, in the school and some who are just people from off the street and in the community. And at the end of the talk, at the end of his sermon, one of the students asked, a very common question. Isn't Christianity a crutch for people who can't make it on their own? He didn't bat an eyelid. John Piper said, yes. It is. And, and, and he goes on to, to talk about the strangeness of that criticism of Christianity. Because... Um, would you criticize someone on a crutch? Isn't the crutch necessary because they're in need? They're helpless. They need to be held up. They can't do it in their own strength. And he says, it's ironic, isn't it, that that's the criticism of Christianity. Yes, it's a crutch because we're cripples. And we're in beggarly need of God's grace. In fact, when I preached that in first service, a brother sent me, uh, Christianity's not my crutch. He says, Christianity's my wheelchair. I don't even have the power to hobble along. I like that. Jesus likes that thought. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who know their need and look to God for help. Poverty of spirit is antithetical, isn't it, to the culture you and I are living in? This is so foreign to the modern ear. It goes against the grain of modern life. The world has its own version of blessedness, and it is centered on human affirmation and human adulation. From magazines 
to the silver screen, to daytime television, to influencers on, on social media. We are told each day and in every way, what? Love yourself. Be proud of yourself. Look to yourself. Trust yourself. Exalt yourself. That hasn't delivered happiness, have you noticed? And I'll tell you another thing, it'll deliver hell. Everything in God's kingdom begins with you being reduced to nothing. The door into God's kingdom is very low. You know, we hear about higher life conferences in the Christian church. Why don't we have a lowly life conference? Because blessed are those who are poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom. And by the way, before I leave this thought, we look at the means, this beatitude, this thought of emptying yourself of any sense of worth before God in terms of salvation, of you having something to commend yourself to win God's favor. Beyond that, this beatitude is a dagger through the heart of the popular American notion that God helps those who help themselves. Have you heard that? Eight out of 10 Americans believe that's in the Bible, by the way. Well, we can tell from Matthew 5, verse 3, it couldn't be in the Bible because blessed are those who know that they have nothing with which to commend themselves to God. Now, now this, this idea of helping yourself Trusting yourself, that's a pagan idea. 500 years before Christ, Aesop, the poet and philosopher, wrote, the gods help them that help themselves. Euripides was a, a, a Greek philosopher who said, listen to this, try first thyself and after call on God. See, that's the spur tar deity theory. God's there. Uh, but you, you know, only go to him when you really need his help, when you've exhausted your own ability, your, your own trust. George Herbert of the 17th century said, help thyself and God will help thee. And in modern days, it was our own Benjamin Franklin who said, God helps those who help themselves. Be a little careful with the finding fathers. It's not all gospel. That's where that comes from. And I want to tell you, that kind of thinking is an enemy to grace. If you've got poverty of spirit, you will not look to yourself for help because you'll have come to an end of yourself. If you can help yourself, then you are a person who is not yet at a place to beg for God's mercy alone. Some years ago, um, I went to the home of a, a, a former minister and evangelist in this area called Ken Connolly. His son David was in the early days here at Kindred Ken. Uh, originally, his family was from Northern Ireland, and his father, uh, Peter Connolly, was a well known uh, evangelist. And, and uh, Mrs. Connolly had kindly invited me to go down and pick through Ken's library because Ken had passed away. And, and uh, you know, to my surprise, I was kind of in late. So I didn't, I was expecting some slim pickings. But I got down there and the first thing that struck me was there was a complete set of Spurgeon's Metropolitan Tabernacle. It's like 66 volumes. I said, nobody has taken this. What's wrong with those guys? Can I have that? And then I got some other stuff. Well, on the drive home, I stopped into one of my favorite secondhand bookshops called The Bookman here in the Orange area. Uh, you know, you'd think I'd been happy enough with several hundred books in my bar, car, but I've got an addiction. So I, I go into The Bookman, and, and I, the guy has seen me many times. I no sooner through the door, and he points me to a series of books on shelves. He said, just got this, and don't know if you'd be interested. It was The Metropolitan Tabernacle. 66 volumes. I said, oh, I just got that given to me about 60 minutes ago. I said, how much are you charging? He says, a um, thousand dollars. I said, thank you, Mrs. Connolly. 
And then he said to me, oh, he says, the Lord helps those who help themselves. And I says, no, sir, the Lord helps, full stop. The Lord helps, full stop. See, people tend to think, you know, what goes around comes around. There's some kind of karma going on in the world. The Lord will help you if you help yourself. You make your own luck. No, sir. That's not in the Bible. The Lord helps those who know they're helpless. That's when he starts showing up. That's when you'll find his grace. What about the means? I need to speed up here. Having looked at the meaning, poverty of spirit is bankruptcy before God, a deep and abiding sense of our need of his grace. We have nothing to commend ourselves to God. We need the righteousness of Christ. We need the gift of eternal life. Well, if that's what it is, uh, how, how do we capture that, maybe, so to speak, or cultivate that? What does it look like to be poor of spirit? What are the things that, that, that help that to be a reality in our life? Number one, dwell upon the glory of Christ. Number one, dwell upon the glory of Christ. Make much of Christ. When you make much of Christ, you'll make little of yourself. Isn't that the case with Paul in his autobiography in Philippians 3? where he talks about the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And when he understands the excellency of Jesus Christ, the beauty of his person, the glory of his work, his self-substitution and sacrificial death on our behalf on the cross, then Paul says what? I put no confidence in my flesh. There was a time when I would have sung my own praises, Pharisee of the Pharisees, blue blood Jew, blameless before the law. But, but I put no confidence in that because I've come to see the beauty of Jesus Christ, the glory of who he is and what he did on my behalf. I can't rival that, nor should I rival that. No, all of that stuff I discard. I count it as rubbish as I've come to see the treasure that he is. All our vaunted opinion of self must be discarded in the light of his beauty. If you want to be poor in spirit, if you want to understand your need, your lostness, and, 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 and the fact that indeed you're bankrupt before God, then do a study on the person and work and glory of Jesus Christ. Colin Smith, in a book on the Beatitudes, says this, the more you see it in yourself, the less you'll see in him. But the more you'll see in him, the less you'll see in yourself. He will expose, his beauty will expose your ugliness. I mean, we, we noted, didn't we, when we opened this series on the Sermon on the Mount, that, that if you look at the Beatitudes, for, for the most part, in large measure, it's a description of who Jesus is. Add the Beatitudes to, to your life, and you will come up with Christ-likeness. Now, he's not bankrupt before God. That's not true of him, but he, he did mourn. He was brokenhearted. He had compassion for people. He was meek, though he was God, yet he made himself of no reputation and came and was obedient to the cross. He hungered and thirsted for righteousness. In John 4, we read, to do the will of my Father, that's my food and drink. We could go on. You get the point. But the point is this. When you and I study Christ and we see the Beatitudes in Him, we'll see the fact that they're not in us and we need Him. It was Phillips Brooks, the preacher in New England, who said, the true way to humble, to be humble is not to stoop until you are smaller than yourself, but to stand at your real height against some higher nature that will show you what real, the real smallness of your greatness is. My friend, don't make yourself small. Just study Jesus and you'll become small in the light of his greatness. Number two, keep your sin ever before you. A conscious and continuous awareness of your sin, known and unknown, breeds poverty of spirit. Do you know yourself to be a sinner? Has that gripped you? Has that haunted you? Has that depressed you anytime recently? 
It should. I love what David says in Psalm 51 verse 3. My sin is ever before me. No preacher needs to remind me of that because I know it full well. I'm an adulterer. I'm a murderer. I'm an evil, sinful man. In fact, the depth of David's understanding is seen in the variety of words he uses in Psalm 51. He talks about iniquity, which means to twist and pervert. He talks about transgressions, which means to cross a line. He talks about sin, which means to fall short of the mark. And David saw himself in all of it. He had broken the boundaries of God's law. He had fallen short of God's glory and expectation. He was a man who was twisted and perverted by lust, leading to adultery, leading to murder because of envy. My sin is ever before me. And yet he knew the grace of God and the blessing of God. God will bless a man who's contrite of heart, he says in Psalm 51 verse 17. Now let me qualify the idea of having your sin constantly and continually before you. While some spend too much time over their sin and wallow in guilt, What I'm really driving at here is the fact that for most of us, too many of us, we spend too little time on our sin. We fall, we quickly dust ourselves down, and we go on. Perhaps abusing the grace of God. Perhaps failing to understand the beauty of Christ, the glory of God's love, and the light of just how ugly we can be and are. That's what I mean. I'm not encouraging you into morbid introspection that belittles the cross and leads you to some kind of Protestant penance. But I'm reminding us it's a good thing to remind yourself of your sin because it produces a poverty of spirit which drives you to God, which, in, which will encounter His grace and love, which is liberating. Oliver Cromwell The English leader famously said, as he sat down for a portrait, paint me warts and all. Men, when they look at themselves, tend to see their finer points. But when God sees us, he sees us warts and all. And we need to be aware of that. We've got to stop whitewashing our sin are belittling the grievous nature of our disobedience. Let our sin ever be before us, which will produce a poverty of spirit, which will bring about the enriching grace of God. Number three, pray. Independence upon God. Thomas Watson, the Puritan, on the Beatitude said, a poor man is ever begging. That's the root of our word, poor, right? Remember we said it's a begging poor. It's absolute destitution. All the beggar can do is beg. And so Thomas Watson takes that idea. A poor man is ever begging, and he who is poor in spirit is much in prayer. If you just want a gauge of where you're at or I'm at in terms of poverty of spirit, how long do you linger in prayer? Letting God know your absolute dependence upon him. Or do we just nod in his direction and run out the door into a new day? We would never say it, but at this point, we're really leaning on our own understanding and we're not acknowledging him in all our ways. That's convicting. It's convicting to me because prayer is an acknowledgement of my need of God. O.S. Halsby talks about helplessness being the qualification for prayer. And when we get to the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, Verses 11 through 15, we're going to see that when we have an opportunity to ask God, it's all about what we need. We need daily bread. We, we need forgiveness of debt, we, we, our debts. We, we need deliverance from evil. We, we need provision, pardon, protection. Let's go back to the Pharisee and the publican. His prayer offered no sense of need. But prayer at its heart is a crying out to God and a display of our need. 
A.W. Tozer said, prayer is not designed for the furnishing of God with the knowledge of what we need. It's designed as a confession to him of our sense of need. Jesus will teach us, your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So why ask him? Because in asking him, you're telling him you recognize your need, your poverty of spirit, your dependence upon him. I like the story of William Newell, well-known Bible teacher among the brethren, written several commentaries that a lot of preachers have. He was once speaking at a conference in China for the China Inland Mission. And as uh, that came to a close, he said to one of the leaders, oh, do pray for me that I shall be nothing. To which the man replied with a twinkle in his eye, Newell, you are nothing, take it by faith. (laughs) We are nothing. We need to take that by faith. But it is a good thing to pray for a recognition of it. And in prayer, we recognize it. Number four, Starve your fleshly arrogance. Starve your fleshly arrogance. We have a propensity to pride. You see it in the child that just brushes off the parent. I can do this. That self-reliance, that, that arrogant pride. Pride is always hungry and must be fed. And so we must starve it to death. We tend to, and given the culture we're in, we've got to starve it to death because this is a culture that feeds pride, self-reliance and self-exaltation. We tend to think of ourselves too highly, don't we? We tend to think that God owes us for some good that we do. We tend to accept praise from others for the gifts that God has given us to bless them with. We tend to accept that rather than deflect it. No, 1 Peter 5, verse 6, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up. It's on us to humble ourselves. See, pride comes naturally. Humility comes supernaturally. How, How would we do that? I wrote several things down to think about myself ways that I could promote humility before God, deny myself. Don't indulge myself. Don't give myself everything that's within my reach or even possible because that can feed my ego and comfort and confidence in myself. Limit your liberties. Have real friends who will burst your bubble and who will wound you. Fear for the wounds of a friend deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Do the hard things, not the easy things. Hold things lightly in the knowledge that God has given you them and he that gives you them can take them without complaint. Acknowledge your indebtedness to others. There's all kinds of ways in which we can starve fleshly arrogance. It's hard. It's daily fight. H.A. Ironside, who pastored Moody Church in Chicago, felt that he needed to humble himself more than he was doing. And so he asked for the advice of a friend. And his friend, well, here's a place to start. Why don't you put a sandwich board on with the plan of salvation and go down to the business district and the shopping district in, in Chicago, downtown, for the whole day? Ironside followed his advice. And upon completion of that humiliating experience, he returned home, and as he was taking off the sandwich board, he caught himself saying to himself, there's not another person in Chicago that would have done that. (laughs) That's hard, isn't it? It's so hard to humble ourselves, but we need to do it. Number five, quickly, we accept the stripping ministry of suffering, and we boast in our infirmities. I'm not saying that suffering is good in itself. It's a horrible experience, and some of you are in the thick of it. And our hearts go out to you. But we know from Scripture, and I'm going to make reference to Paul, that by God's grace, that experience that's hard and difficult, that's not good in itself, can have a ministry that's good. 
because it strips us. Doesn't cancer strip us? Doesn't financial bankruptcy strip us? Doesn't betrayal of friends strip us of self-reliance and a sense that we've got it together? Suffering strips us, strips us down to a point of desperation and destitution and humility and a poverty of spirit that rightly handled can be good. Isn't that what Paul argues about his thorn in the flesh, which he did ask God to remove because it's not pleasant. But God let it stay, give him grace to handle it, and Paul came to see, you know what? That humbled me to a point where I became a recipient of grace. It, it emptied me of trust in self, and it filled me with a renewed trust in God. And, and he says, I am happy to boast in my infirmities because when I am weak, then I'm strong. The good of suffering strips us of any sense of adequacy, making us poor in spirit and a candidate for God's sufficient grace. That's why we can and should count it all joy when trials come because they produce in us spiritual abilities and qualities. George Matheson, the blind Scottish poet and minister, said, I have thanked God for the roses, but I've never thanked him for the thorns. But sometimes the thorns are a ministry, just as they were in the life of Paul. Finally, sixthly, appreciate the least of God's mercies. This is poverty of spirit. This maintains it. This gives evidence of it. You, you, you and I need to realize this morning, we do up here, I'm not sure we do in here, head to heart, that we're always doing better than we deserve. We are, because we're bronze plucked from the burning. We're hell-deserving sinners. There was a time in our life where the wrath of God abided above us like a Damocles sword, but now in Jesus Christ we pass from death unto life. And we will not come into judgment. And so everything's gravy. Everything's a bonus. And, and we're always doing better than we deserve. And that breeds a poverty of spirit. When you, when you take time to count your blessings and name them one by one and be surprised what the Lord has done for a hell-deserving sinner like you. Isn't that what David, what produces David's, listen, what produces David's gratitude in Psalm 103, 1 to 5? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and, and, and let's not forget his benefits. He forgives sin. He, he redeems our life from destruction. He feeds, fill, fills our mouth with good things. Well, the answer is in verse 10. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. When you understand that, you'll be an ever grateful person. A grateful heart is a heart that is poor in spirit. A complaining heart is the opposite. To complain is to believe that you deserve better, which is hardly poverty of spirit. In his book on John Stott, Tim Chester tells the story of his assistant, Corey Wind Windmere, who would help Stott as, as necessary. Stott was a bachelor, and uh, so he often had an assistant helping him on practical matters and things around the manse and the parsonage. And on every day while Corey Widmer was his assistant at 11 o'clock, he would bring in a nice hot cup of coffee to set beside John Stott. It was either preparing a Sunday sermon for all souls in London or writing a book. And he said, Corey says that every morning as he was turning to leave, he would hear Stott kind of mumble or whisper, I'm not worthy. Just getting a cup of coffee, I'm not worthy. Now, the assistant put up with this for a while, but he thought it rather strange. And then one morning, as he put the coffee down, turned around and heard the, I'm not worthy. He said, oh, yes, you are. It's only a cup of coffee. But that great man of God challenged him 
where he said this, you haven't got your theology of grace right. It's only a cup of coffee. No, that's the thin edge of the wedge. Now, it might seem strange for a man to make such a big deal about a cup of coffee. But I think Stott's trying to teach his man, given what we should be receiving, the full wrath of a holy God. Isn't a cup of coffee a beautiful thing? Isn't a breath of air an ounce of energy? A blue sky, the love of a friend, a good church, the possession of your Bible. Do we need to go on? When you and I stop enjoying those things, it's the thin edge of the wedge, my friend. And you're moving away from poverty of spirit. Okay, last point's very short. The mercy. We kind of touched on this a week ago when we talked about the contradiction of happiness, but let me just double down quickly. Verse 3, so blessed, happy, fortunate are those who know their need of God's enriching grace, who are spiritually bankrupt, who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is emphatic in the Greek. It means theirs and theirs alone is the kingdom. This is the person alone who belongs in the kingdom. This is the person alone who's in the kingdom, the humble sinner who has begged God for mercy and received it. Lowliness is the birthmark of those who belong to the humble and lowly king who made himself of no reputation. It's in the present tense. Remember the important point we made last week in verse 3 and verse 10. The first and eighth beatitudes are present tense. The rest are future. So there's a big emphasis on the blessings that await us in the kingdom of heaven, in the eternal state, in the millennial kingdom. But but it's not just by and by, pie in the sky, when you die stuff. No, you and I are enjoying aspects of the kingdom now. The rule of God, now. The care of God, now. This is present tense. It's a present position. I like what John MacArthur does in his book on the Beatitudes. He said, if you want to think about the the present aspect of God's kingdom and the future aspect of God's kingdom, the already and the not yet, we are now enjoying the grace of the kingdom, and someday we'll enjoy the glory of the kingdom. It's good. But we are enjoying the grace of the kingdom now. God has taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and put us into the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians 1 verse 13. And we are now seated with Christ in the heavenlies and all spiritual blessings are ours. Remember when we studied that? That's one long sentence in the Greek where Paul is breathless in accounting for God's blessings. Don't have time to go there. Verses 3 to 4, we're chosen. Verses 5, we're adopted. Verses 6, we're accepted. Verse 7, we're redeemed. Verse 7, we're forgiven. Verse 8 and 9, we're informed. Verse 11 and 12, we're enriched. Verse 13, we're sealed. Verse 14, we're assured. That's all ours right now. Those who belong to the kingdom belong to God and enjoy his many, many gifts of love and concern and care. Let me finish with this story of Dr. Barnhouse, who once pastored the pulpit of the pastor of the church of 10th Presbyterian, and one morning in the pulpit of that church in Philadelphia he preached a, you know, a, a wonderful message. He, he hit a home run. People could sense it just in, in, the, in the service of a message on God's grace and, and the blessing of God's forgiveness and as a treatment of our sin in Christ. He said this, our sins are forgiven, forgotten, cleansed, pardoned, atoned, remitted, covered. They've been cast into the depths of the sea, blotted out as a thick cloud, removed as far as the east is from the west and cast behind God's back. And uh, at the end of the service, A little boy who had listened to the sermon, 12 years old, bounded downstairs to meet his pastor at the door. And after he had shook some other hands, the little boy came up to him and said, gee whiz, doc, we sure are sitting pretty. 
aren't we? Those of us for whom is the kingdom. Someday we'll sit and reign with Christ. But right now, in, united, un, in union with him who's seated at the right hand of God, we sure are sitting pretty. Adopted, redeemed, kept by the power of God, looking forward to an inheritance that's reserved for us in heaven forever. Grace now, glory then. Father, thank you for the word this morning. Thank you for this beatitude that promises happiness to those who are poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom. Lord, um, help us to see our need of you, our bankruptcy before you. Help us to recognize nothing in our hands we bring, simply to the cross we cling. Could our zeal no respite know? Could our tears forever flow? Not for sin could these atone. Thou must save and thou alone. And so, Lord, we have begged and you've heard us and you've given us the gift of eternal life and the promise of kingdom life. Lord, help us to humble ourselves. Help us to um, be lowly of heart. Help us as we leave this morning, go out into a world that inflates the ego and tells us how good we are and how great we can become. Help us to remember how bad we are and how great Jesus Christ is. Lord, we, um, we're happy to take the crutch of the gospel, the wheelchair of the gospel. We thank you for loving us and saving us and by your power keeping us. And we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.